Thank you. Thank you for having uh, me here today, and uh, thanks for sticking around. Do you know there's a cigar bar over there? It's one. Uh, in any case, how many people here in the audience today have children that they know about? Show of hands. Show of hands. All right, good. I have, I have three, uh, three boys at home uh, and four dogs, and my wife and I are pretty much crazy uh, most of the time. Uh, how many people here are big Star Wars fans? Show of hands. Like, star, like you dress up and go to cons, Star Wars fans? Or like there's different levels, right? So I've been a, a Star Wars fan. I, I don't know what level you want to put me at, but uh, my youngest son, his name's Luke. Now I was excited, being a Star Wars nerd, that my wife agreed to name our son Luke. But she was like, you can't overdo the I am your father bit. I'm like, that's cool. I can keep it under control. It's cool. So while he was still in the womb, I would whisper to him, I go, Luke, you will go to the Dagobah system. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's not I am your father. So now we try and reenact the whole thing um, with my son, Luke, and he's three. So we've got a lot of, like, rehearsing to do. So I'll be like, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. And he'll be like, he told me enough. He told me you killed him. And he'll, like, get his arm and it's like stuffed in his sleeve and stuff. So we're working on it. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun at home. Um, so you'll see some Star Wars references in here, uh, specifically referencing uh, the past uh, and a lot of cool stuff. To go along with the talk theme, um, security isn't doomed, if we learn from the past, but we've had kind of a rocky, a rocky past, right? I don't think anyone here would raise their hand and say, like, we got this whole security thing figured out. Like, there's no risk in my organization. We're 100% safe. I don't expect anyone to raise their hand to that. If you do, it's okay. You're lying. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so there's been a lot of breaches, right? And oftentimes we like to use breaches as an excuse for us to say, you should do security. And I just think that's a really bad analogy. Um, one of the breaches was actually uh, an anime pornography site where apparently they like pictures more than videos. It was really, really strange. Um, the Capital One breach, though, uh, was interesting and probably war actually warranted a segment that we ran on our show uh, with Peter Smith from Edgewise. And if you want more information around the technical aspects of that breach, make sure you check that out. Um, so I don't like using breaches to say that we need security. Um, and also, this is one of the more, I'm actually going to talk about defense and how to protect yourself uh, and apply security, not attacking, which is kind of kind of new for me somewhat. Um, but uh, the one, some of the reasons why I don't like to use breaches is because it doesn't really translate. Like, if we want to say, I want to raise awareness so that, like, people don't steal cars and people secure their cars and make sure they lock their cars, like, what would I do? Show them gone in 60 seconds? And if I want to prevent um, wrong side surgeries, which is a huge problem, I'm not saying it's not a problem, you know, I, I guess we could run some awareness by, you know, like, writing on ourselves before surgery, you know, that, that might be good too. Um, you know, also with seatbelts, in cars, oh, everyone go, oh, look, how cute. You're like, how do we advocate that people wear seatbelts, right? Do we show them, you know, like car accidents? Because a breach is kind of like a car accident. Um, so I don't think any of that stuff really holds up. Um, the point of this talk is really to draw inspiration from concepts in the past, uh, understand that it's okay to draw inspiration from the past and build upon what other people have done in the past to motivate all of us, maybe people outside this room, maybe our clients, customers, friends, whoever, to do better at security. Um, there's a lot of different points we can pull from, music, film, books, um, and even things within security, uh, and that nothing is truly unique, and that's okay. Um, so I wanted to look into the past and see if we could find some security concepts that relate to uh, some security concepts or security concepts themselves that we've been able to borrow from so that we can be good motivators and not, not bad motivators, which is another Star Wars reference. Um, so let's talk about music examples. Now, 
every uh, song on this slide has been sampled. It's actually some of the most sampled uh, material in music today. And what's interesting is that a lot of music that you maybe may or may not know has sampled from things in the past. I gave an entire talk um, uh, a couple years ago at DerbyCon about um, hip-hop music and how it relates to security and how hip-hop culture relates to security. Um, and what I realized was that, like, my dreams were shattered. The hip-hop songs that I knew and love and grew up with and still listen to today l largely were sampled, mostly from late 60s, early 70s soul music, which if you create the right playlist on your favorite uh, streaming service, um, you, you may hear things like this. Does it, anyone know what that song is? Anyone? Go ahead, shout it out. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Anyone know? Uh, it, it is from the album uh, the uh, 2001, um, which came after The Chronic. Uh, that was actually the original, though. That's actually David Axelrod. Anyone? Anyone? No? No big David Axelrod fans in the audience today? Uh, the song is actually called The Edge. Uh, and, of course, they took it and made the next episode. Now, I could sit here for the whole time. It would be a lot of fun to play this game for the whole talk, um, which I'm kind of tempted to do. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe one more. Uh, any uh, Wu Tang Clan fans? Wu Tang, Wu Tang, Wu Tang, Wu Tang forever, right? Right? All right. But now, Wu Tang Clan wouldn't be what they are today without this band called the Shormels. That's the original. That's as long as I've got you by the Shormels. And uh, we're all adults in the room today, right? Like there's like curse words, it's artistic expression, right? Um, so. You can hear the same, I mean, it's, it's some of the samples are like exact. So. Um, now, like I said, we can, we can stick around after and play a game even more because it's a lot of fun. Um, but it's got me thinking, what was the most sampled track? It actually turns out that all of the albums on here and uh, over 3,000 different songs have sampled from this one track. Does anyone know what that is? Has anyone read the, the article? So in 1969, this band called the Winstons um, put out this B-side. In the back of the B-side, was a track called Amen Brother. Amen Brother, at the time marker of 126, has the most sampled drum solo in music history. The article states it's about uh, you know, over 1,000. Um, according to whosampled.com, it's over 3,000 samples. Now, there's a lot of interesting things. Like, does anyone, was anyone alive in 1969 that wants to admit it? Like, you were like a baby, right? You can, we'll just, we'll go with that. We'll go with that, right? It was a big year for a lot of things. Man on the Moon, Sesame Street. Any, anyone else like ridiculous 1969 facts? Woodstock. Thank you, Woodstock, right? Also, this single. Now, you notice that the band, too, one of the fascinating things for me is that it's a mixed race band in 1969. And if you study you know, know what was going on in 1969. I think that was the year after um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, right? Um, right around that time. So this was amazing for a whole host of reasons. Now, my good friend Kevin Finisterre pointed this out to me because I consulted with him on my hip-hop talk. And he was like, Paul, my challenge to you is to tie all this ridiculous knowledge that is like, you know, Cliff Clavin style knowledge. I'm just full of useless knowledge. Tie it to security. And he challenged me. He said, what is the security equivalent of the Amen break? We should probably listen to the Amen, uh, the Amen break though, right? Let's see if I can scroll. All right, here it is. Coming up in five seconds.
Now, I'm sure everyone recognizes it, right? That's the almond break. No, no one does, and they never got any money for it, right? Poor, poor band, never got any money for it. So uh, in my original talk, I didn't have a good answer for Kevin. Like, Kevin, I have no idea what the security equivalent of the almond break is until I did the research for this talk. And I was like, wow, in 1969, that's when the first version, it was an unnamed version of PDP-7 of Unix came out. And I'm like, if there ever was or is today an Amen break in security, it's Unix and Linux by a landslide. And it's interesting today when I speak with people and consult with them on security, and they say, well, you know, we, we don't have any Linux. We don't run any Linux systems. Like, I'm crazy because I run Linux desktops. But they're like, we don't, we don't have any Linux. I'm like, are you deploying applications on containers? And they're like, yeah, the developers, they use that word container a lot. I'm not sure exactly what it means. I'm like, you're probably running Linux. Like, how many containers do you think you're deploying? Like, tens, hundreds, thousands? Each one of those is Linux and probably could be running on top of Linux as well. Um, so we all know and love and have to secure uh, Linux today, and I think, you know, its history is interesting, um, and I got lucky that it, it tied together with the year, in any case. So film. Uh, film is also an area where uh, artistic expression has been borrowed, which is just a fancy way of saying people have copied each other or paid homage, and it takes different forms. And in a lot of cases, it's okay. I mean, some of your favorite movies are up there. How can you not like Back to the Future and the classic clock tower scene, right? How can you not like Pulp Fiction, um, which is in here twice, right? Um, does anyone know some of the other movies on here? Particularly, the movies on the right are ones that they uh, uh, borrowed the artistic expression from, right? So, um, it, it's interesting. There's a lot of different movies up here that borrow from each other. Um, and there are also, uh, you know, ties into music as well um, that may or may not have been sampled, if I can find it. Maybe not. Oh. All right, well, that wasn't sampled, okay? That was original music and absolutely brilliant. But if there's one movie that did a lot of borrowing and creative inspiration, it was Star Wars. Now, bear with me. We're going to go fast, and we're going to get to security at this point, right? Because I've got a lot of useless knowledge I put up here. So Akira Kurosawa is a very famous Japanese filmmaker. He made The Hidden Fortress. George Lucas borrowed very heavily, especially for um, A New Hope and Episode 4. And you can see those parallels. And I had never... Uh, well, so I'm a nerd, so eventually I went to look and, and saw some of the inspirations um, and what he drew from in the two films is pretty, pretty awesome to look at as how much inspiration he drew. Why Chewbacca didn't get a medal, I don't know, and it still bothers me to this day. Uh, maybe I'll get over that. Um, also, I thought it was interesting that when we all see those words that go, you know, away from you in the beginning of Star Wars films, I was like, Lucas did an awesome job creating that himself. Now, it turns out there was a, a 1930s and 40s TV show called Flash Gordon, where he got not just that from, but was the inspiration for Cloud City in Empire Strikes Back as well. Okay. Now, started getting on themes that we're sharing in common to get to security, and that is Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell wrote a book, I believe, in the 1950s, and Joseph Campbell studied uh, mythology and the myths that have basically been floating around since the beginning of time. So when we talk about borrowing from the past, this is the most extreme example. He studied all these myths, not to look at their differences, not to draw inspiration or gain insight into them. He looked for similarities between them. And what he came up with was the foundation for all of these stories shared basically the same plot line, and that is the hero's journey or the monomyth. And it was this specific series of events that is also in our dreams, as he discovered, but also shared in commonality with all of these myths. Um, and Star Wars follows the hero's journey, right? It's the call to adventure. Luke, you must come with me to Alderaan, right? 
and he wants to get power converters at Tashi Station, or whatever the case may be, right? So it, uh, this is a hero's journey. Now, I won't go through all of them, but you can see where this might follow the Star Wars plot line, right? Uh, a hero has a normal life before the adventure begins. He's uh, faced with something. He doesn't want to go on that mission. Then he meets a mentor. Then he crosses the first threshold where he leaves the ordinary world and goes off to uh, potentially do something great and mythical and magical. He has uh, tests with enemies and allies. Um, and it goes on from there. I'll shorten it for the sake of this presentation. Now, how many people here have read The Phoenix Project by Gene Kim, right? Wow, you, you got some reading to do if you haven't read The Phoenix Project. The Phoenix Project was based on a book um, by Goldrack called The Goal. The Goal was essentially how Toyota, uh, basically Toyota, did lean manufacturing and the concepts that were in there and was told in a story format that had characters and you learn the lessons of lean manufacturing and the theory of constraints in a story. Gene borrowed that and created the Phoenix Project to create a story that would allow us to understand the theory behind DevOps. And guess what? Uh, before I get to that, they also, after they released the original book, they released uh, an audio series called Beyond the Goal. Gene Reese Beyond, uh, released Beyond the Phoenix Project with John Willis. Uh, and they talk about the origin of DevOps and help you understand it better. I actually, you still have to read the Phoenix Project. I actually got more insight from the Beyond Phoenix Project audio book than I think I did from the original book. Uh, so make sure you check those out. Now, the interesting thing is they all of these works follow a hero's journey. So when we talk about learning from the past, these are some of the most influential books, I think, in our field, in manufacturing, and arguably one of the greatest film series of all time, borrowed from the same concept from Joseph Campbell. Because Luke's a farmer in the desert, and not to spoil the plot, because most of you haven't read The Phoenix Project, but Bill is a character in The Phoenix Project. He has an ordinary IT job. Obi-Wan says, come with me to Alderaan. Bill gets a promotion. Luke says, I, I can't go with you to Alderaan. I don't want to go on this mission. Bill goes, I don't want the promotion. It means more responsibility, which means more work, right? Uh, then they meet a, wen a mentor. Luke has Obi-Wan. Bill has this character, Eric, who has a background in lean manufacturing that teaches him DevOps. Luke saves the princess. Bill has some realizations about DevOps that help him in his job. Then they have uh, enemies. Luke meets Vader, and Bill meets Sarah. I hate Sarah. She's a character in the book. Okay, so... Building on those concepts that we're going to heavily borrow from the past, what can we borrow from in the past to have better security programs today? I have three topics that I want to talk about that both borrow from the past but are extremely relevant today and things you should be doing or considering doing, planning on doing uh, in your organizations today, recommending that others do because they really help when it comes to security. And the first is... DevOps. Uh, I know Matt Rose spoke a little bit about DevOps and CI CD pipeline, so we'll, I'll try and build on what he said. I caught most of his talk this morning, um, so I will try not to repeat any of his content. Uh, I want to show it to you in practice uh, a little bit about my background. I started programming when I was seven years old. Um, I was in the late 90s a full time programmer for about a year before I figured out that I didn't want to be a full time programmer and I wanted to do networks and security and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I did that. And when you're a security person, you write software, but it's mostly scripts for yourself. And then about four months ago, we didn't have a developer at Security Weekly for our internal application. So for the past four months, I've been the primary developer. Uh, having been a, and still am a security person makes for an interesting perspective. One of those perspectives is how software development used to go, and I say used to go because it's still somewhat like this today, in that programmers spend months on a release, they dump it on QA, and QA tests it for a month or so, 
and maybe reports back some bugs. Then they release it to the users, and the users are frustrated because it has bugs. Then they hand the application to a pen tester, and the pen tester says, you've got 1,237 vulnerabilities. Please fix them all. It's a hot mess, right? And this is the model that we're trying to get away from. The model that Matt spoke to this morning and that in practice I'm striving towards is that in your development process, there's static analysis and linting. And Matt spoke about this, but really what this means is my IDE, my software, tells me things as a developer, and if it's done correctly, I actually listen. So I code in Python, which is a uh, weakly typed language, which means you don't have to define variables. When you get over 8,000 lines of code like we have in Python, that starts to really bite you in the butt big time and it gets annoying. So one thing I did was I go into the interface and I said, tell me about variables that could be referenced before assignment. Tell me about variables that are undefined and don't make those warnings, make those full on errors. So every time I push a release, I'm to getting rid of those things. Now that's not necessarily a security vulnerability, but you can apply the same logic to security vulnerabilities, hence the first step in your DevOps-like process. Because then, if that's automatically happening before check-in, now I can release every day. Like Matt was talking about in DevOps, we release every day in a continuous integration, continuous deployment environment, continuous testing, we release every day. Every day, binary analysis, software inventory, and automated QA are happening. So the Linux packages that are built into my containers are getting checked to make sure that they're not vulnerable. And even GitHub will do uh, some of that for you today. It will also do that on your Python packages. In my own application, I was using Python packages that had vulnerabilities. Gasp. I had, I'm a security person. I was ashamed. I was like ready to be kicked out of the security community, like you're not welcome here anymore. Pull my security card. And so I changed them, built the application with the new versions of the libraries. It uh, built in it, I tested it manually because we're not quite there yet, right? I built it, I tested it, I pushed it up to GitHub. GitHub's like, you're cool now. I'm like, that's awesome. So that's an example of the software inventory control that was talked about earlier today. Uh, and then there's also the feedback loop. You see those arrows go both ways, right? When I'm a developer and I put a Python library inside my application that has a heinous vulnerability, when I go check that code in, I get a ticket immediately that goes, you need to fix that. And then I go fix it and I re-push it back out. So part of this is the feedback loop, which is very important. The other part is we talked about scanning. Um, I have a kind of a different take on scanning after I wrote a bunch of unit tests myself. Um, Matt also talked about unit testing, which is great for functionality. What I would like to see is somewhere in between unit testing, which is I'm writing tests inside my software to test for functional, any kind of functional bugs. And we also talk about scanning, uh, dynamic scanning, web application scanning. Somewhere in between there, I think there's really an opportunity for me to write tests that have access to all of the elements in the application, but are also doing some level of scanning. I don't know too many vendors. In fact, there's one that I haven't really fully researched yet that are doing things like that, but I think that's definitely the way to go uh, in terms of testing today, especially for me, because I, I write really bad code sometimes. Well, mo most of the time. Uh, so then we release that to users, right? There's a feedback loop for our users as well. A lot of people are introducing bug reporting uh, inside of their applications. Maybe I have a bug bounty that finds two major vulnerabilities. I've also got some type of runtime protection. I'm kind of jaded. We use um, one of our sponsor's products, um, Signal Sciences, works awesome for that. I also like uh, Capsulate. I think that's great for the container level security. So there's something running in today's uh, modern deployment inside my container that's applying runtime security because again, Paul writes sloppy code some, most sometimes. Um, so what, this is what we uh, really mean when we say that like I do DevOps and I think that we talked about there's 3% of people that are actually doing DevOps, except they're actually lying. And that's because most people do it this way, which is the way that I try to do it today, where I write code, I test it locally, I push to Git, 
I run mostly broken or outdated unit tests. That's the thing with Agile that I think is important. We talked about Agile development earlier today. Agile says when you've got a bug or you're going to introduce a new feature, write the test for that first. Then go fix the bug, go implement the new feature, and use your test to do that. It forces you to write the test first. If you fix the bug or write the feature, you're probably not gonna go back right, and, and write that uh, unit test um, after the fact. Um, so for that reason, I like Agile. I wish I could say I practiced it, uh, but I'm the only developer now, uh, and hopefully that changes soon. We do have a job opening for a programmer, so if you know anyone, uh, send them our way. Um, so when we feel ready, and it's more of a feeling than an actual state of our application, we push our development code into our staging environment. And then in staging, basically if it doesn't crash or give us a heinous internal server error, the dreaded internal server error when you're developing web applications, we then go ahead and we push it into uh, production. Um, that bullet software automatic creates, that's probably for the next slide. Ignore number six there. Um, so where I want to be is to automate this process, right? Is to create a full continuous integration, continuous deployment environment where this happens automatically. Basically, as the developer, my IDE is telling me if I'm writing stupid code or I'm writing really good code or somewhere in between, I check my code in. If it passes all of these tests along the way, it gets pushed up to the next stage. So if something's looking at the composition analysis and it passes, it'll push it to the next stage. If development builds and passes security testing and passes functional testing, it pushes it to the next stage. If in staging, we're testing with production data, I often find a lot of bugs arise from actually testing with real data and not test data. So we do a test, or we're planning to do a test, that will test with real production data. Security-wise, you have to treat it the same as your production environment. Um, but we do those staging tests, and then it's automatically pushed into production, and that happens automatically. And breaking a build, as Matt said, is something we get to determine. If my IDE tells me that something's wrong, if any check along the way tells me there's something wrong, you get to make the decision whether or not that breaks the build. And I tell you what, I think as security people, we need to get away from even wanting to break the build, because if you think about the way DevOps and uh, CI CD is working, your next release could be hours, could be minutes, could be less than a day. Can you live with that security vulnerability for the next couple of hours? I think for the large majority of bugs, we as security people would have a tough time making a case to say, no, you can't push that into production uh, versus waiting an hour, let it go. And the important part is there's a feedback loop to a developer that says, in your next release, this is your highest priority, go fix this bug, right? I, I had one of those that I found. I locked myself out of my own application and I couldn't log in. Has that happened to anyone? Does anyone do development? Is that, is that just me? I'm sure it's not just me. I couldn't log in due to a bug, due to a database mistake, a configuration, whatever it is. So my solution being the hacker was, I found the point in the code that checks the user's password hash against the one in the database. And instead of if this password hash matches the hash in the database, I just said if true. And I put a big comment. I'm like, never do this. This is just Paul being ridiculous. I just need to do this once. And then I, I forgot to uncomment it. And I was in the code the other day. And I was like, wow. It like doesn't matter what you put for a password, it's always gonna log you in. I'm like, that's really bad. I should probably have a check for that that breaks the build. That's one you could probably make a case that should break the build. But these are the kind of custom tests that we need to start building into our applications because I think it's really hard to find those uh, in an ubiquitous kind of manner, in a generic kind of manner. So the basic principles, if you haven't read the Phoenix Project, it will put context around basically these three things. Work is sp split into smaller chunks. Hence in DevOps, it's not one release every six months, it's six releases every day. We're splitting up work into smaller chunks. There is a constant feedback loop. 
on the production assembly line where we're making cars, on the production assembly line where we're making software, at every point in the production, there is visibility and telemetry that's being sent back to someone who can fix that issue or needs to be uh, aware of that issue. The third thing in DevOps is don't start something unless you have all the materials. This was a huge problem in manufacturing. They would go get the materials to start a job, they wouldn't have everything, and then everything would get all messed up. I think we have similar process issues uh, in our own development processes um, and in our own business processes in general. That last one I actually use very heavily in our business processes, which then we wrote software to satisfy those requirements. Okay, now, what I want you to think about, not just DevOps applying to software development, but DevOps applying to IT and operations. Now, there are some people who have done this successfully that I've heard. I haven't spoken with them yet. I would like to. That would be awesome. If you're doing it, please come find me. However, the way that it used to go, if we think of sysadmin and systems and operations as development uh, in uh, basically the way it used to go and the way it largely works today is that we spent months building a system. We took physical hardware, we had to put it in the data center. I'm looking at Jason because you, you were there, right? We put it in the data center, we put the operating system on it, we spent months installing new software and testing it, very similar to the way we used to do waterfall development. Then we dumped it maybe on a subset of users for a month or so or more, and we let them get really frustrated with it and tell us it wasn't the right solution and that there was a lot of bugs and there wasn't enough documentation, and if there was, it wasn't the best documentation. Um, and that, then we release it to all users, and you can see that they're depicted as wanting to punch their screen out of frustration. Then we had a penetration test, and we have 1,237 vulnerabilities. Now, you'll notice one constant in all of these diagrams, whether it's a traditional method of software development, a traditional method of systems administration, or a SecOps or DevOps process, is that management is always in the corner, and that arrow's only going one way in every single diagram, and they're asking if it's done yet. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? Can it be done faster? And that's typically what the requirements will be, right? So what if we applied a DevOps philosophy to systems administration? We could call that SecOps, and we had you know, we could have a debate over all of this terminology and acronyms. Um, but what if we were building stuff from known good sources uh, and secure configurations that we uh, pre-populated beforehand, and we worked on today's system updates and releases. We were releasing systems and building systems in smaller, more manageable, chun manageable chunks with a feedback loop as to whether or not it was successful. We can do that in systems administration. We have software inventory analysis and asset management inside the process as well. When we spin new stuff up, it gets added into asset management. It checks the software inventory, makes sure nothing is vulnerable that I'm rolling out. Hey, that software included a vulnerable version of Apache, therefore you get an alert and a ticket, and then that vulnerable version of Apache never ends up in production. And we get to decide what breaks the build and what doesn't. Now, an area that, uh, sorry, so we also do vulnerability scanning and patching, and it's automated. The solutions today, uh, Qualys, one of the sponsors here today being one of them, right, realized that we can do a great job finding vulnerabilities, and then since we know what system and what the vulnerability is, can't we just go patch it? I worked in vulnerability management for seven years. I always said the same thing. Thank you for finally implementing it. And there are other vendors that do that too. If I find a flaw, I just, I want to go, just, just go fix it. It's fine. Just go fix it. So I think that's a, a reality that is upon us today that requires more adoption. Then the other part of this that's very similar to a uh, software DevOps pipeline is breach and attack simulation. I want automated processes that are gonna go and try and break what I just built. And there's this whole new category that spawned in security that the entire last third of this talk uh, will address directly, um, but I think it's a, it's a portion of your SecOps process. Then we may also have bug bounties and we may also have runtime protection. 
That was applying DevOps to your systems administration. Now I want to talk a little bit about threat hunting and where we can borrow from the past. Now threat hunting, it's not like Duck Hunt. Everyone remember Duck Hunt on Nintendo? That's a blast from the past, right? Uh, threat hunting is looking for things that have already been broken into, already been compromised, an attacker that's already in your system, and going into your own network and looking for those. So I think one of the first references to this uh, is in Cliff Stoll's book, The Cuckoo's Egg. Please tell me there's more people that read The Cuckoo's Egg than the... You got some... Re have, who's... Anyone read The Cuckoo's Egg? Show of hands. The Cuckoo's Egg. It was one of the books I read really early on in my security career that inspired me to be in security today. It's awesome. Essentially, one of the concepts that they're talking about in this book, I, I want to say it was published in, after 1986, but still in the late 80s, um, was they were trying to resolve a 75 cent accounting, accounting error, and this guy, Clifford Stoll, goes into the system to find the hacker. And that's what threat hunting is today. It's not a new concept. We talked about it, or Cliff talked about it in a book that was based on a real world experience in the mid to late 80s. This crazy guy, Paul Asadorian, wrote a paper in 2005 using IP Audit, which was looking at NetFlow data, to discover systems on the university network that had already been compromised. What I was loosely describing was what we term as threat hunting today. Uh, that article is really old and, and somewhat outdated, but interesting that the process was the same. So we fast forward to today, and I'm like my good friend John Strand. I'm like, look, I'm seeing all these new tools and techniques. They're calling it threat hunting. Wouldn't it be great? Like, I want a tool today that really would have helped me was when I was at the university in the early 2000s trying to do what we now call threat hunting. John, like, basically wakes up the next day, and he's like, oh, so I got this GitHub repository now, and basically I've created this free and open source tool called Rita, and it does exactly what you described, and it's free, and it's open source. I'm like, thanks, John. That's awesome. Um, don't Google image search for, for John Strand. I had to do it for this presentation. Just, just don't. There's an underwear model named John Strand. It's not what you think. Anyway. Uh, so uh, Rita is out there. And what Rita is doing is looking at network traffic uh, packet captures and looking through the traffic to look for patterns that could be malware or other types of malicious software on your computers that are phoning home. If something sends... Uh, a few packets on the same port um, it, at you know roughly the same sizes every day, you'll see that with Rita. It, it's really cool. It's a way to look through you know gigabytes and gigabytes of packet captures and go look at this communication that's happening regularly. That's malicious software uh, and does it really accurately, especially for being free and open source. Okay, then I got thinking that since I'm a Star Wars nerd, that we should talk about some of the shortcomings of the Empire in Star Wars. I mean, they really sucked at security, like, in general, and, like, corporate culture and leadership. But to poke on the fact that they, they really stunk at threat hunting uh, is kind of fun, and we should learn from the Empire uh, rather than ourselves after we've had a breach. So let's teach the Galactic Empire how to threat hunt by first looking at uh, some of the cases where they had malicious uh, insiders. Now, oh, and maybe other things that we could have done threat hunting on. Has everyone seen the movie Rogue One? Rogue One, right? If, if you have, you may want to. If you haven't, there might be some spoilers. I mean, in the end, I don't want to spoil it for you, but they blow up the Death Star eventually. That's that's what. Any case, this is how they got all the stuff to be able to blow up the Death Star. Hopefully, I don't spoil it too much. Now's your chance to run out of the room if you really haven't seen Rogue One. Um, so Galen Erso is the architect, designer, engineer for the Death Star. Uh, he was able to build a vulnerability into, remember the thermal exhaust port, right? That was the vulnerability that he built in. The, he sends a transmission to his daughter um, uh, that essentially says, I've built a vulnerability into the Death Star. That's all the message said. Right? It didn't say like exactly how. He was like, basically, you got to go get the schematics and break into the backup facility, to steal the backup tapes to get the schematics to figure out how to do it. Now, my question is, 
why didn't Galen, who's already an insider, the lead designer, uh, an engineer for the Death Star, have access to the schematics and just send that? I guess it wouldn't really be a movie if that had been the case, because the whole movie's about how they break into the backup facility uh, and do that. So in any case, they need to steal the schematics. How do they do that? They steal um, a cargo shuttle. And the ship's computer has codes that basically bypass the firewall on the planet that houses the backup tapes. Essentially what they're doing is that tried and true tactic we see all the time. They're stealing credentials from memory and replaying them to gain access to another system. And that's how they gain access to the backup facility. But that just gets them access to the backup facility. They then have to impersonate guards and officers to be able to roam around the backup facility and then reuse more credentials, essentially biometrics, right? Very similar to like, you know, holding up someone's hand to the, the fingerprint reader or whatever. Now, does that sound familiar for you Star Wars fans dressing up to gain access to a facility to, to do something? Yeah. So they borrowed from themselves. But in any case, physical access after they had reused credentials, then also reusing more credentials. Um, then there were the uh, covert channels. And the kind of lame attempt, um, the director uh, Orson Krennic uh, plays the kind of like crazed lunatic uh, operations guy that's like, I want, basically starts to figure out what's going on and says, I want every dispatch, every transmission that Galen uh, Urso has ever sent. Uh, he, Galen was the designer of Death Star. He wants to look at all of his traffic. Well, it's kind of too late for that. Like, that's a lot of logs to go through. And what if they used encryption? You're not going to know exactly what, uh, what happened. So I hope Galen used some type of encryption. Um, but they're in basically full-blown incident response mode. Uh, and then, you know, we all know what happens after that. But the other thing is, like, if these guys had just blown up that escape pod, in the beginning of A New Hope, I, I guess there really wouldn't be much of a movie after that either. Anyway. Um, so what could the Galactic Empire have done better in terms of threat hunting? Discovering covert communications. It's actually in the MITRE attack framework to look for covert communications, especially from those who have access to sensitive information or areas in your network that contain sensitive information if there are potential covert channels, whether you're looking for those on the systems or across the network, should be something that you're looking for, especially during a threat hunting exercise. Has anyone made communications or tried to exfiltrate data or put some piece of malware that is using some type of uh, callback or uh, channel using Rita? Know when your credentials are stolen. Now, that can be somewhat difficult, right? You have to know when someone does breach a system and steals credentials. It, detecting and, and logging that process might be difficult. What's easier, though, is once you discover a system has been compromised, you can look and see what credentials may have been on that system, maybe legitimately on the system as the user credentials, maybe credentials stored in memory, and see where else those credentials have been used. In the example from Rogue One, they steal a ship. That's like someone stealing one of the laptops from your organization. What's the first thing that you do when someone steals a laptop from your organization? Probably reset that user's password, right? And not only that, log and alert when someone reuse, tries to reuse those credentials, if that is the case. So. The Empire did not do that, and that's really uh, a component of threat hunting to kind of lead you down a certain path. Are there credentials being used that may have been stolen? Uh, and then correlate physical access with these other events, right? We have someone reusing credentials from a stolen piece of property or uh, a, a compromised system, and then we have physical access controls that, um, you know, physical logs that are showing there's nefarious things going on within the facility, people who don't normally belong here, after those credentials are being used. So correlating these things together uh, is extremely important, not just the cyber side of stealing and reusing credentials, but correlating that with 
physical access as well. Hopefully, Chris told you this morning some of his stories from social engineering engagements. No? Yes, no? Or did he talk about something different? He was on Security Weekly and told awesome, awesome stories just recently uh, about uh, this particular, you know, uh, impersonating people to gain access to a physical facility. Then, looking for sensitive information in places where it shouldn't have been. Uh, I think it was uh, Todd from Envision that talked about documents that phone home, right? That's a component of your threat hunting, of your incident response plan, is inside of the sensitive information, putting in your own beacons inside of a Word document that if someone opens it up on that system, it sends through the code in the Word document, maybe just an HTTP GET or POST request to a server. Uh, you can actually do this for free with uh, Thinkst Canary Tokens. If you search for Canary Tokens, those are free. Haroon Mir is the uh, founder of the company. You can embed those security tokens in really just about anything, and essentially to let you know if someone else is running your JavaScript code somewhere, if someone else has opened your document somewhere that they shouldn't have, right? So knowing when sensitive information is somewhere that it shouldn't be, knowing that the schematics to the Death Star are in fact on an R2 unit that's in an escape pod. Uh, so, breach simulation and continuous testing. Now, what's interesting is I did these enchanted quadrants a while ago, so I'm borrowing from my own past um, to basically say when we want to detect indicators of compromise within our own networks, we use endpoint protection or endpoint telemetry. We use our SIM and our logs. We use the network detection and prevention, and we correlate that with threat intelligence. That's four primary ways that I uh, diagram out to basically figure out if you've got a breach or not. The blue team then has tools at their disposal as well to help prevent either that breach or that breach living inside of your network. Those are configuration management, making sure everything's configured securely, vulnerability and patch management, which we talked about, identity management, which a previous presenter talked about too, asset management, knowing what you have, right? Those are the four quadrants. Now, let's say you've done all of that. You say, I've got all these indicators of compromise. I've got endpoint. I got SIM. I got threat intelligence. We're correlating it together. We do all the things that are on the slide. How do you know? How do you know, right? In DevOps, we have stuff to make sure we write code that is secure, stuff to make sure that we have uh, packages that aren't insecure. But once it gets into production, how, how do we know it's really secure? Um, for time, I'm going to skip that one. Um, Basically, the thing that exists today in IT and operations is breach and attack simulation or automated breach and attack simulation. This is awesome. This is like taking a component of DevOps uh, and your CI, CD uh, uh, pipelines and putting it into IT operations. So on an automated basis, these systems can go in and try and break into all of your systems. They can try and put code on your systems. They can try all of these different techniques that are in the MITRE attack framework that are not in the MITRE attack framework and run that against your production system safely and tell you what, what happened. Was I able to put uh, malware on this, simulated malware on this system, and was it able to phone home? If it was, we, we did something wrong when we deployed those systems because this was successful. It tests it on a constant basis, which has feedback loops. There's a couple of different varieties, some that um, will tie into your defensive technologies, right? So it's like two different major flavors. One being, we're gonna test your systems and configuration and software, make sure that it's configured securely. The other component is, you've got everything on Paul's enchanted quadrants, right? IOC enchanted quadrants. Did any of those technologies even notice that something was breached, that even in a simulation? If it didn't, then you've got work to do. Some of these tools will actually tie into your sim and say, hey, we ran the simulation and we got this far and we checked with the sim automatically and the sim really didn't log anything that would be indicative of a compromise, but since you've got XYZ vendor sim, here's the way you can configure that so in the future, you detect this kind of breach. That's awesome. Uh, 
that's actually, actually, Veridin has a, a good solution for that. And not to just name one vendor, I'll put all the vendors up there that I am at least somewhat familiar with. There are others. If you're using others that are not in this slide that you really, really like, please come find me. Uh, I'd love to talk with you. But there are commercial solutions to do this, and there are open source and or free solutions to do this as well, all of which... Um, you should be working, uh, looking at Infection Monkey from Gardacore actually just got updated, um, so make sure you check that out. So final thoughts. Use DevOps and associated methods to improve both software development and your IT processes. Now, I do have to say that um, I think it was Matt that was talking about the barriers to implementing full DevOps or full SecOps. Really, I've experienced that's time. Like, I, at some point, I have to take a time out from fixing bugs and writing new features in the software and go build a CI CD pipeline, go build the tests. And I just, I'm not afforded that luxury. I think a lot of companies aren't either. I think it's the same way in sysops as well. Sysadmins and network engineers and cloud engineers have to take a time out to build the process. Perform threat hunting on a regular basis to understand if you've already been breached. You can use both commercial and open source tools to do that. Um, an automated breach and attack simulation is something you should be looking into to understand your weaknesses and exposures. What's uh, do last things that's interesting about this talk, this talk was created in coming full circle using materials from a lot of my previous talks uh, that so I borrowed from my own past uh, as well as borrowed from others uh, in the community uh, and was inspired by folks like Josh Wright um, who first started introducing some of these concepts in here. Also, if you want the slides, uh, that's totally fine. Also, if you took pictures of the slides, that's cool too, but uh, at least tag me in social media because a lot of times people take stuff out of context in the slides. They'll be like, you used breaches as an example of why things are broken. I'm like, yeah, but you had to be there, <laughs> right? And it's totally fine. You can take pictures of the slides, put them on social media, uh, just include me so I can provide any context that might be required. If you do want a copy of the slide, email slides at securityweekly.com. That will go to me. More importantly, it will go to the lovely young lady over here named Sam, who makes everything happen at Security Weekly as the operations manager. So uh, thank you. And questions. All right. Well, I'll be around for a little while. Uh, so come flag me down if you have questions. So thank you.